Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of uh, Quantum Computation and Isolation. So I'm very happy to be introducing uh, Professor Matthew Hastings today. Professor Hastings got his bachelor's degree uh, at Yale in 1994 um, in mathematics and physics. He got his PhD in physics in 1997 from MIT under Professor uh, Leptov. He was then an R.H. Dick Fellow at Princeton University from 1997 to 2000. And then he held a director's fellowship at Los Alamos um, in 2000 before becoming a professor at Duke University and finally joining um, Station Q and uh, Microsoft Quantum. He's recipient of many awards, including but unlimited to um, the Los Alamos National Lab Achievement Award in um, 2004, the Postdoctoral Distinguished Performance Team Award in 2003, the Lockett Award at MIT in 1987. He was a recipient of a uh, NSF grad fellowship from 1994 to uh, 1997. So please help me in welcoming either by unmuting and clapping or by clapping virtually Professor Matthew Hastings. Okay, uh, thank you. So I'm gonna be talking about the power of adiabatic quantum computation with no sound problem. And I'm gonna explain what all that means. Um, and I'd really like to encourage questions because, uh, you know, if it's just a matter of uh, a recorded talk that she's listened to, then, um, well, probably there are other people giving talks on the subject, uh, Andres Gillian and Umesh Vazirani, who are probably giving better ones you could listen to. So um, I'd really just like to encourage taking advantage of the opportunity here to ask questions as I go along. And I'm going to be handwriting some of the stuff as I go along too. So that's great then if we can make it interactive. Um, so I'm going to talk about what is. Uh, adiabatic quantum computing. It's a computation model for uh, quantum computing. What's the sign problem? Um, what happens when we combine these two, adiabatic quantum computing and the sign problem? And why do we care about this question of putting the two of them together? And then I'll talk about the main result, which is um, what we call an oracle separation, which is a term from computer science. And I'll explain what those are. So there's going to be a bunch of different things, um, combining things from condensed matter, computer science, quantum information here. So I'll try and give background on all these three different fields as needed. Um, and this is based on uh, two different papers down below. So uh, the first paper by myself giving a first separation between this adiabatic quantum computing and classical computing. And then a subsequent paper by Gillian Vazirani that uh, simplified the construction and um, significantly tightened the bounds. So um, what is uh, adiabatic quantum computing? So. Um, the normal model that people think about for a quantum computer involves gates and a circuit. So you have um, a bunch of qubits, which are just like and a half particles, and you have a bunch of gates, just like classical computing involves a bunch of bits that are zero and one and a bunch of gates um, at the lowest level, things are done in terms of logic gates, like AND gates, NOT gates, and so on. Um, classical computing will be quantum gates, which will be unitaries that act on a few bits. Um, and the usual model is that you, you know, prepare qubits in, a in some state and act on them with a bunch of gates and then measure something. Um, adiabatic quantum computing is a different model for quantum computation. Instead, you have a Hamiltonian that changes as a function of time, a function of a parameter, and you change that parameter as a function of time. So as an example, we could have a Hamiltonian, and I should write actually h sub s here, sorry, h sub s, which depends upon a parameter s that's in the interval zero to one. Um, and it's a sum of the simplest case, we could imagine it's a sum of two different Hamiltonians, one minus S times H naught plus S times H one. So um, that will linearly interpolate between H naught at S equals zero and one at S equals adiabatic quantum computing as you imagine that you slowly change along this path. And you assume that the initial Hamiltonian has a ground state that's easy to prepare. Um, you know, in general, if I just give you a Hamiltonian, it might be hard to prepare the ground state. It might be hard to even know anything at all about the ground state. But you assume that the initial H naught has some ground state that's easy to prepare. And you assume that the final Hamiltonian H1, somehow its ground state encodes the answer to the problem you're interested in. You're, you have a problem you're interested in and you uh, figure out some choice of H naught and H1 so that you can prepare the ground state of H naught so that H1, its final ground state has encodes the answer so you can learn it by measuring something. And um, the hope, well, if you can tune su sufficiently slowly, so if, the, if you have a ground state and an excited state, um, 
And if they're separated by a gap along the whole evolution, if you evolve slowly, you'll stay in the ground state. If you evolve quickly, then you'll start to transition into um, excited states. So as long as the gap between them is not too small, then you can um, stay in the ground state throughout, throughout this evolution and um, then learn properties of H1. If the, if the gap becomes small, then you have to do a very, very slow evolution. And if there's actually a level crossing, then this won't work at all. And there's kind of a, a mantra in computer science um, when people, there's, there's sort of two parts of it. One is that we'll, we'll use a number N to denote a number of qubits in the problem or a problem size. Um, so we might be interested in optimizing some problem like a, um, finding, maybe your problem is actually find the ground state of some classical spin glass on N bits and it's a purely classical problem or some other classical problem, solve a traveling salesman with N cities. There's some N which represents the size of the problem. And the kind of mantra is that something is efficient if the time it takes is at most a polynomial in this n. So a time, you know, n or n squared or whatever, n cubed um, would be efficient. Well, as a time that's bigger than polynomial and maybe even worse, like exponential would be not an efficient case. So the, the question is whether you can do this efficiently. And in order to do this efficiently then to stay in the ground state, we want the gap to be only polynomially small so we can stay in it by taking a polynomial time. So this might seem like a kind of, um, so I'm just gonna like write an example here and please, interrupt with throughout with questions if things don't make sense. So um, a specific example that people consider, and this was one of the um, original ways that people thought about, it, thought about it. Well, I'll give two examples that people consider. Um, one example is literally studying a physical system. And I think this might date back to some old work of um, Lloyd and company at Los Alamos in the late nineties. Um, but uh, um, the, the idea is that you have a, although I'm forgetting the reference. So if you're, watching this recorded, yeah, I, I forget what the reference is. So the idea is maybe you have some interacting many body system, you know, you have some, some system where you have like some Hamiltonian, which is like psi dagger i, psi j, t i j, plus some, you know, v i, n i, n j, v i j, n i, n j, like, so it has some like repulsive term, some Coulomb interaction and some hopping term, and that's some Hamiltonian. And you say, oh, I, I'm, I'm interested in learning the, the, the properties of this Hamiltonian. Um, maybe I want to know the energy of it, or maybe I want to know the, the occupation number of a certain site. Um, this, is a, this is an actual relevant physical problem. And then you say, well, how do I prepare the ground state of this Hamiltonian? Um, so there's a bunch of ways you can do it. Uh, there's methods using phase estimation, but one way you can, simple way you can imagine doing it is that maybe this particular Hamiltonian, which might be some interacting many body Hamiltonian that you're interested in for physical reasons. Maybe it's a system relevant to condensed matter like a Hubbard model, or maybe it's a model from quantum chemistry. Um, it's some molecule or something. Um, this, this, this Hamiltonian maybe is connected to some simpler Hamiltonian, like a free Hamiltonian where this V is not present, this V is absent, where the ground state is just a Slater determinant and within appropriate encoding of this many body state on your quantum computer, you can prepare that. So you can imagine just, okay, we're going to prepare or just an actual physical setup, maybe you could prepare that. So you could prepare the ground state without this interaction term and then slowly turn on the interacting term and then you'll wind up in the desired interacting ground state. If the gap becomes small, um, well, it depends how small the gap becomes, whether or not you'll be able to do this. If you just get a polynomially small gap, you'll be able to maybe go very slowly and remain in the ground state. Um, if the gap gets too small, you won't be able to do this um, evolution. So this is kind of a, a quantum example of a case where it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> And uh, um, later I'll give a, I guess, a more purely classical model uh, where it's sort of like here, you're, what you're trying to learn is something about a quantum Hamilton. I'll give a model in a minute where you're trying to learn something about a purely classical problem. So we can ask how powerful is this model of adiabatic quantum computing? You know, it's instead of being phrased in terms of gates and circuits, it's phrased in terms of Hamiltonians and maybe even just two Hamiltonians that you linearly interpolate between. Um, so there's a result of Aharnov et al. from 2004 that shows that this model is equivalent in power to the standard model, um, the, circuit, the standard circuit model, which is called BQP of quantum computing, um, meaning two different things. So first, if you have a problem, an adiabatic quantum computing problem, you can um, uh, Steal it. Uh, is there something on chat here? Uh, do we how much of the interval has a one over poly n gap? Well, we really need the gap to stay. Oh, yeah, that's type of question here. We really need the gap to stay um, uh, 
So if there's if there's chat, people could just make it to everybody instead of just me. So there's a question: Do we care like how much of it is one over poly n gap? We want it to be at least one over poly n in the entire interval. If it gets, you know, typically it will only get small at certain points, and so then maybe you can go faster by going faster where the gap is big and slower where the gap is small. But really, we want the gap never to get too small. Um, so adiabatic quantum computing is time evolution of a Hamiltonian, and you can make up quantum circuits that simulate time evolution. So if you want to do time evolution under some Hamiltonian HT, you can take your time and up into time steps dt, and then each time step dt can be simulated by a quantum circuit using, in the simplest case, something like a Trotter Suzuki decomposition, or you can do um, more sophisticated methods that will give work a little faster, but they're all polynomial. So um, adiabatic quantum computing is no more powerful than ordinary quantum computing. And the question is whether it's, and this is the importance of the gap being only polynomially small, so you can do it with circuits of only polynomial size. Um, conversely, the sort of surprising thing is that any, um, anything you can do with a circuit, you can do with adiabatic quantum computing. So you can come up with some very carefully chosen H naught and H one so that H naught has a ground state that's easy to prepare and H one and H naught encode your circuit and you evolve from H naught to H one and the gap never becomes too small. And then by measuring some final properties, you um, succeed in learning uh, um, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the answer to the computational problem that you do get from H one. So um, they're equivalent in power. Now it's not really clear whether this adiabatic quantum computing is any easier than um, sort of the usual circuit model. On the one hand, you might think, oh, this is this is easier because I don't need to control the circuit as a function of time. I just have two Hamiltonians. I sort of slowly turn off certain terms and slowly turn on certain other terms. On the other hand, um, there is no, the, the theory of error correction for adiabatic quantum computing isn't at the same level as that for the circuit model. There's no really like fault tolerance where you can tolerate um, levels of noise throughout the evolution. So uh, um, it's not clear whether you could build one more easily or not. Um, oh, wow, okay. um, so uh, now let me talk about, that's sort of the background on what adiabatic quantum computing is. And I'm gonna be combining adiabatic quantum computing with the sign problem. So let me talk about what the sign problem is. Um, you know, a sort of a standard thing that everyone is used to in physics is that uh, if you can compute the partition function, you can kind of compute everything. So um, you know, so maybe you want to know like an energy of some physical system. Um, to get that, you need to know the partition function, not just the partition function, but it's derivative with respect to, to parameter like inverse temperature beta. Um, but generally kind of once you've worked out the partition function, you can probably also take those derivatives. So really the problem is always working out a partition function. Um, and in a quantum setting, the partition function, instead of being just e to the minus beta h, where h is a classical just diagonal operator, now h is a Hamiltonian, that's the thing. You're interested in a quantity like this, a trace e to the minus beta h, the trace over all states. And um, if you can compute that for some Hamiltonian, now I'm just talking, I'm leaving the realm of adiabatic, I'm talking about something completely different and we'll combine the two, um, some fixed Hamiltonian, and you want to compute e to the minus beta h. Um, <clears throat> what uh, uh, um, you can do is you can write down a path integral. This is um, the usual path integral method done in imaginary time. Um, and uh, an important property, you know, you can, you can, is that if all the off diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian are non, are less than or equal to zero, non-positive, and this is a basis dependent thing, if they're all non-positive in a particular basis, then the weight of all the paths is non-negative. So it's a sum over weights that are non-negative. So um, what you might have is you might have a Hamiltonian that's just written as a matrix and it has some matrix elements like hij. And we're going to say that hij is less than or equal to zero if i is different from j. Um, then you can um, write down a path integral. And I sort of have this thing where I've written the, a schematic con con configuration of this system and a schematic imaginary time. And you can imagine jumping from configuration to configuration. So a weight of a path in that case where it's like HIJ would be, well, if you just stay in one configuration, the simplest path is where you stay in a single configuration I. And then the weight of the path is just E to the minus beta HII. That's the weight of that path. But you could have a path that goes, jumps, 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 and from configuration I to configuration J. And while it's staying in I for a certain time, it's E to the minus, let's call it tau, 
H I I, then it stays in this configuration J for a time. So I'll have E to the minus tau H J J. And then there'll be some transition elements from I to J. So H I J minus H I J. And then again, we're going back from J to I. So another minus H I J. And then there's some DTs and stuff that you need to integrate over the D tau. Sorry, I've got two different tau's here. So one is the one of the tau's is the time for this first interval, and the other one is the time for this second interval. Um, so you've got these uh, these weights, and it's just like you stay in a certain. You have a you have a, a, a thing depending upon the dialogues, and every time you jump, you have a weight that depends upon the matrix elements. But all the weights wind up being positive numbers if um, all the off diagonal elements are non-negative. Non this is a basis dependent property. Um, and of course, if you just diagonalize the Hamiltonian, there's a basis where there's no sign problem. But the important, the interesting thing is are there are cases where there's a nice local basis, a basis that's just related to like just the basis of the spins being up or down, so we have the property. Um, and once you have this problem, property of no sign problem, there's a natural algorithm called path integral Monte Carlo. Um, so, or it's called Quantum Monte Carlo, Path Integral Quantum Monte Carlo, many different names for it. Um, let me know if you can hear me. I'm getting a warning that my net is unstable. So let me know if anything breaks out. Okay, I lost it. I was gonna move closer to the router, but I guess it's good. Um, so this uh, Path Integral Monte Carlo, um, what you do is kind of just like ordinary uh, Monte Carlo. So an ordinary Monte Carlo algorithm, you might have a classical system and you would have some classical partition function e to the minus e over kt summed over different classical configurations e. So now here we have is weight of the path, which is this function that is non-negative, summed over paths. And in the classical case, what you would do is you would um, make up a, 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 tr a transition function. So you would say something like I have maybe a system of spins, an Ising system of spins, and I have some uh, Hamiltonian that's you know like maybe Jij. Uh, sigma i, sigma j, where sigma are these plus minus one classical variables. And you might make up a transition rule, which is to say, I'll flip a single spin and I'll accept or reject. So classically, you know, you would accept or reject with a probability that depends upon the difference in energy. So you might say like, if uh, the final energy like E prime is less than E, you always accept. And if prime is greater than you accept uh, the E to the minus beta E prime minus E. So you sometimes raise the energy, but you can using, you can compute any observable that way. Um, so, um, you can do a similar thing quantum mechanically. Instead of thinking about like accepting or rejecting a spin flip, you might think about accepting or rejecting a little change in the paths. And I've kind of sketched it down here. I've shown one path and I curved on the right, drew something in red where instead of the particle curving out that way, it curves back a little bit the other way. So you could accept or reject certain um, paths, changes in the paths. And this will work if you can equilibrate the, um, um, uh, uh, process. So the, the, the stationary point of this Markov process is the desired um, uh, um, probability distribution, but you might not get there. You might get stuck, uh, maybe stuck in some like local minima of, of the energy or, or something like that where you can't, where you can't properly equilibrate it. Um, so uh, in a sense, these problems with no sign problem are more classical than, than the, the typical problem. So, so certain Hamiltonians have a sign problem, certain do not. Uh, this path integral Monte Carlo is um, a very important tool in kinetic matter physics and high energy physics for studying systems. Um, and it's not available for all systems, but it's available for some. So in practice, in many cases, people are, are able to equilibrate, but not all. Um, just, and I'll mention it also because this is relevant for the rest of the talk that, uh, um, there's another thing called diffusion Monte Carlo, which is another algorithm that can be used for uh, systems with no sign problem. And this is based on a sort of thing that's strange from a physical point of view. You interpret the amplitude of the wave function as a probability. So, I mean, if you had some wave function psi of x, everybody is used to thinking that psi squared is the probability, and that is physically correct. 
But if you have psi positive, you could just think of psi of x itself as a probability. Um, and what does it mean to think of it as a probability? Well, there's this algorithm diffusion of Monte Carlo. And what you have is you have a bunch of walkers. Walkers are um, just little particles, each of which is in some configuration of the system, like some actual configuration. If it's a uh, if it's literally like a particle moving on the ring, it's just a place where the particle might be. Or if it's a system of quantum spins, it's a configuration of the spins in some basis. These ones are up, these ones are down. And um, then walkers can diffuse. They can move from one trajectory to another based on the off-diagonal terms of the Hamiltonian. And this the fact that the off-diagonal terms are non-negative allows you to interpret that as a transition. And there's also a birth and death process. So the diagonal terms in the Hamilton are birth and death. So um, what I sketched here is several walkers, and this is direction is a configuration, and this direction is a time, not an actual physical time, but the simulation time. And as on this simulation, new walkers are born. So you might have an event like here where a walker splits in two to two walkers, or you might have walkers dying, like an event here where a trajectory just ends. Um, when walkers are born, where the diagonal terms are more negative, where the energy is lower, and they die where the diagonal term is more positive. So this, um, you can choose birth and death things so that this, so that the probability distribution for walkers exactly reproduces the Schrodinger equation in imaginary time. Um, the trouble is, and, and can you equilibrate it? You can get stuck in cases where there are large fluctuations in the number of walkers or, you know, where um, all the walkers are in the wrong spot. And if you could get the walk, get one walker in this much deeper well, then that population will grow for the simulation in this higher well would die. Um, so, you know, you could have a situation where there's like one high well and another low well, and you have all these walkers here and they're just happily living in this well. But if one walker could ever tunnel over to that one, suddenly this walker would create many more and these would all die. So it's unable to equilibrate because of it gets stuck due to fluctuations in the number of walkers and due to more subtle obstructions we'll talk about. So um, this is another way that no sign problem is sort of more useful. So the talk is about combining these two things. So why would you combine um, adiabatic quantum computation with you know, a sign problem? There's an adiabatic optimization algorithm, which uh, by Farhi et al, um, where this Hamiltonian H1 encodes the optimization problem. So the, the algorithm they wrote, let me, um, they, they picked a particular Hamiltonian. They said H of S, it's a linear path. This was the first one. And you can consider more complicated things. Um, it's two different things. It's, it's we're gonna imagine a system of uh, um, qubits, spin a half particles. Uh, so there's one minus S X. And what I mean by X is it's just the sum of a transverse field, sum over I, X I plus some H of Z. And what is H of Z? H of Z, oh, H of Z times S. So it's a linear interpolation between two terms. One is a transverse field pointing in the X direction on every qubit, and that's the initial Hamiltonian. And then the final Hamiltonian is some diagonal term problem. It might be a, a spin glass. It might be, you know, ZI, ZJ, um, JIJ for some glassy JIJ. And if you can get to the ground state of that, you've found the ground state of some spin glass and, um, solve some optimization problem. You can perhaps think of this as being a classical, a quantum analog of things like simulated annealing. Um, oops, wrong way. Unfortunately, uh, so, so this, is a, this is a model that has no sign problem. Um, it's, it's a case with no sign problem um, in this particular setting because you have a diagonal thing, which is this classical thing, and then you have this off diagonal thing X, but that has no sign problem. Um, there is currently, very strong evidence that this algorithm is not useful for unstructured choices of H1. So if you take H1 and you just pick it to be some spin glass problem, which you're interested in solving or some, you know, traveling salesman problem or whatever optimization problem, classical optimization problem you can think of, that this algorithm will not be useful. And the gaps become even worse than exponentially small. They become super exponentially small due to work of Altschuler et al. Um, Nevertheless, there is even a device you can buy uh, or devices you can buy um, that are uh, D-wave devices that are sort of at least originally based on thinking about that, although they also have thermal effects and other things. Um, and uh, so although this, there's strong evidence that this algorithm is not useful for unstructured choices of H1, it raises an intellectual question, which is, useful. Could this thing become useful? You know, once we've got this with this strong restriction that the Hamiltonian has no sign problem and um, we're going to do adiabatic computation, can this actually be a, a useful thing to solve? Or could all these devices just, you know, be simulated classically? And that's the, that's the intellectual question. Um, 
Also, I should remark that even if you add a sign problem into uh, the um, adiabatic algorithm in a kind of naive, unstructured way, um, then uh, the evidence is still that that doesn't really help if you just add some local terms with a sign problem and may even hurt things. So, um, so if we if I draw a sort of a Venn diagram here, um, we can imagine at the top adiabatic quantum computing, where you just imagine arbitrary Hamiltonians, and um, this is equivalent to BQP. Um, uh, this is this was mentioned at the start. Just arbitrary Hamiltonians you do adiabatic evolution is equivalent power to quantum circuits. At the bottom, um, we can imagine Hamiltonians with no sign problem. So um, these have to be hard, meaning like one of the simplest Hamiltonians you can think of with no sign problem is just a classical Hamiltonian. It's a diagonal Hamiltonian, and you can think of a Hamiltonian that's say a, a spin glass, and it's hard to find the ground state of a spin glass. It's an it's an NP hard problem. Um, there's some work of Bravi et al. that shows that plausibly, even if you add in quantum fluctuations, it probably doesn't get any harder than NP under various de-randomization assumptions, um, but it's at least NP hard. So it's at least hard if you're just given a Hamiltonian with no sign problem. And I said, hey, tell me something about the ground state. What's its energy or approximate its energy? That's a hard problem. Um, but now we ask this intersection, this purple reason uh, in, the, in the Venn diagram, what happens if we combine them? Um, and we might expect it's easy. And sort of the plausible reason to expect it's easy is that when you have no sign problem, you can imagine that it's not very quantum. Maybe you can come up with a classical algorithm that samples the ground state if only you could equilibrate it. Um, like path integral Monte Carlo would work great if you could equilibrate it. Um, but how will you equilibrate it? Well, we have this adiabatic evolution. So maybe we can use that to help us follow the ground state so we don't lose it. So there was, you know, um, quantum Monte Carlo or path integral Monte Carlo, where you imagine um, doing it in adiabatic way. So you imagine some Hamiltonian H sub S and what you do is you equilibrate it at a particular value of S, like equilibrate S equals zero, which is E for these uh, Hamiltonians that they're interested in, all the spins are uniformly up or down. Um, and then you change us a little bit and equilibrate again, change us a little bit, equilibrate again, change us a little bit and equilibrate again. Um, and it was, it's a plausible island. It's been used in practice and um, works uh, reasonably well and has even led to some interesting possible useful classical um, optimization algorithms. Um, I should say that uh, it doesn't work in general. Uh, you can come up with examples, um, and I'll get to that, where this won't work in general, but still, um, in the, 2013, uh, Mike Friedman and I came up with examples where this path, simple path integral algorithm didn't work in general, where you could make it break down and fail. Um, but still, there's this, this question, like when you combine these two things, can there really be quantum effects that make it beyond the power of classical computing when you have no sign problem? Um, so the main result, and uh, is that relative to an oracle, and I'll explain what that it means, there's no efficient, meaning polynomial time classical algorithm that will solve this um, problem of adiabatic quantum computing and solve it in the sense of, for example, um, it will be able to figure out what the final basis state is, what the final configuration is in the, in the, in the computational basis, assuming even a very strong constraint that the final configuration is just a single basis state. Um, so like a configuration of classical spins up, down, whatever, in some way with non-negligible accuracy, more than exponentially small accuracy. Um, so there's no classical algorithm to solve this problem that you can solve quantumly, uh, even when there's no sign problem in the sense of relative to an oracle, and I'll explain what that means. Um, and initially, um, the first lower bound um, was uh, n log n. It took a number of queries that was at least queries to the oracle, I'll explain what that means, but it's a lower bound on the time required relative to the oracle. Took a time n to the log n, which is just barely not polynomial. So like n is polynomial, n squared is polynomial, n to the 100 is polynomial, but certainly not gonna be efficient in practice. Um, but n to the log n is not a polynomial. It's just barely above a polynomial, sometimes called quasi-polynomial. Um, it was strengthened, though, to a stretched exponential, an exponential of a, of a sublinear power of n by Gillian and Bazarani um, later. So the bounds were improved. So what is an oracle? Um, so an oracle is the uh, essentially the only technique the computer scientists have to prove um, lower bounds. And uh, so there's a famous problem, this, you know, does P equal NP? Um, and the thing that's kind of amazing is how far people are away from proving it. There is just 
absolutely no hope to prove it. No one even has any clue how to prove that much bigger things are different, that like polynomial time is different from what you can do in polynomial space, even though polynomial space is believed to be itself vastly bigger than NP. There's really just no technology for proving these separations in, in most cases. Um, you know, the, the, the conjecture separate setting is, is shown as is shown in this diagram here that there's like P, BQP is a little bit bigger, P space is a little bit bigger. Um, NP is going to be something else that contains P, but um, still inside P space, but isn't the same as BQP. There's things you can do on a quantum computer that you can't do in NP and things you can do in NP that you can't do on a quantum computer. But um, there's really no way to prove these separations. And I said, oh, we're gonna prove that it takes at least there's no classical algorithm to solve this problem, but how do you prove there's no classical algorithm to solve it? Um, so this is where the idea of oracles comes in. So oracles are, um, you assume that there's a black box that you can query. Um, well, let me give, let me, let me sort of mention that, that one of the simplest oracle separations you could imagine. So um, uh, if you, if you imagine a, um, uh, uh, a classical spin glass. So you imagine some problem like j, i, j, z, i, z, j, where z, i are plus minus one variables. And you're asked to find the minimum of this problem. Um, this is an NP hard problem. We don't think there's any fast problem to do it, any fast algorithm to do it. We think in fact that it may take really exponential time in the number of spins, but we have no hope to prove it. But imagine that, so this is, this is the function. This is the energy as a function of the spins. But imagine instead there was simply a black box routine, a black box routine, some routine F that you feed it a vector of these spins, Z1 up to Zn, which are Boolean variables plus minus one. And it just returns what the value is. And there's no assumptions made on it. Let's say there's no assumptions made on this F. Maybe what we say is that, oh, one of the configurations has energy zero and all the other configurations have energy one, but there's no assumption. It's just one particular out of the two to the n possible configuration. So what you're doing is you're trying to look up in this dictionary and there's all these bit strings, zero, 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 zero. Well, that's energy zero, 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 one. That's energy zero. And eventually, you know, bit string one, one, zero, one, or whatever it is, is energy one. You have to go keep querying the Oracle. You assume there's no structure. You assume that there's a, a function you can just ask, okay, um, Tell me what the energy is. Tell me what the energy is. Tell me what the energy is. And you're going to have to query it roughly two to the n times in order to find that one configuration with the um, particular different energy. Um, so that's a case where you can prove a separation because it's it's sort of easy to prove that if you don't know anything about this function, there's a black box function, it will take you exponentially many times of asking it to find one distinguished value. Um, so the same thing here. Um, instead of imagining that there's a single function that you query that gives you, say, the energy of your spin glass. Um, and of course, that's not true about like a real spin glass. A real spin glass will have some structure and will allow you to speed things up. But this is the only way we know how to prove things. Um, so we assume, again, there's a black box that we can query. What this black box will do is, is instead you'll feed it a basis state. You'll tell it, okay, this is my basis state, which is some bit string. And it will just tell you, these are the other basis states that have a non-zero matrix element to the basis state you gave me. This is how big the um, matrix element is. Um, and you get to know the basis state, which is the Hamiltonian at the start of the evolution. And um, that's what the Oracle tells you. There's a lot of technicalities. We'll assume that the Oracle uh, gives you a Hamiltonian that are the terms in the Hamiltonian are bounded, that the gap is only polynomially small throughout the evolution or else it wouldn't be an adiabatic problem. The derivatives are polynomially bounded so the Hamiltonian doesn't just like suddenly change um, and so on. So there's a lot of technicalities on what the Oracle does, but in general, just assume that there's an Oracle that you ask questions of and you say, this is, this is, um, uh, this is uh, my basis state, what can I get to from there? And actually, you know, most algorithms work like this. There's a subroutine that computes matrix elements. Um, Somewhere inside it, there's a subroutine that computes a matrix element from one state to another state. Um, and so this is gonna be a lower bound in this Oracle setting. So any algorithm that claims to always do this adiabatic with no sign problem and never get stuck, which itself could be quite actually practically useful because it might be useful for um, getting rid of some of these ways that you get stuck in equilibrating quantum systems. Any algorithm that claims to work like that has to manage some structure of the Hamiltonian. You can't just treat the Hamiltonian as this kind of black box. Um, so before talking about beating all algorithms, um, which is the more recent result, let me talk about how you beat some specific algorithms. Um, and there, now we don't even need oracles. We're just gonna write down some specific Hamiltonians and say, well, this Hamiltonian, we, I can, this, this algorithm, I'll show you how you can make it fail. So one is this um, path integral Monte Carlo. Um, so let me first show you what 
Pathing Girl Monte Carlo does not get have a problem with. Imagine we have a double well potential. Um, I've drawn a double well potential here. Um, I've just imagined a single particle moving in one dimension. And it's got two wells um, and some potential V of X. So it's like Schrodinger's equation with two wells. And one well is a little bit lower than the other well. And imagine that then, so that initially the ground state is completely concentrated in this right well. And imagine we slowly change the um, uh, uh, height of the wells so that eventually the left well becomes lower than the right well. Um, at what will happen is then eventually the true ground state will move from the right well to the left well. And you can try and work out in the simple one dimensional setting, oh, does uh, path integral Monte Carlo equilibrate? Will it be able to move from having most of the configurations here to most of them over there? So it starts to have to include configurations which start at one well and move over to the other well and then back to the first and then until eventually they're completely concentrated on the left well. Um, Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. It may have a problem if the barrier between the wells is too high, but that will occur exactly when the gap is small. So if the gap is only polynomially small, path integral Monte Carlo in the simplest way will equilibrate in polynomial time. Um, so there really the ability to equilibrate matches the gap. There is a worse problem with path integral Monte Carlo though, that it can have problem with um, equilibrating different topological sectors. So imagine now moving um, not on a, uh, single line, but imagine a particle moving on, I'm gonna draw a figure eight. So the particle can you know, move around like that, move around, but then it can also jump from one ring to the other and it can then even go all the way around one of the rings and then go around back like that and so on. Um, so now you can describe the world lines of the particle in imaginary time by, um, well, it has its trajectory, I drew a trajectory, but there are different topological sectors. The topological sectors involve, you know, going around this ring or going around that ring. And we can write um, uh, those topological sectors. Um, one way to write them is in terms of sort of words. So I'll write down an A every time you go all the way around the bottom loop one way, or I'll write down an A inverse if you go around the other way and a B for going all the way around the top. So you could write down a topological sector, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, for example, which means go around the bottom, go around the top, go backwards around the bottom, and then go backwards around the top. Um, and there's all these different topological sectors. And when you look at local moves, they don't equilibrate between them. You know, if you go around, you can choose to go around a little bit faster or a little bit slower, but there's no local move that will take you from going around to not going around. And if you're stuck in a single topological sector, um, it turns out that then the algorithm makes a large error in the energy. It, it will misestimate the energy by an amount of order one. Um, not, not a tiny amount, but a large amount. Um, and the reason is that uh, intuitively there's these words. And if you have an imaginary time of length beta, then the length of the words is of order beta. And so the number of words is exponential in beta. So the partition function should be uh, something like, um, sum over words, some partition function of the word, but the number of these is some exponential in beta. And so it's misestimating the partition function is essentially losing that factor of e to the beta. So it's misestimating the energy by a factor of order one. Um, equivalently, equivalently, it can be understood as an energy difference between the space, the, the figure eight and the cover of it, which is a graph with degree four. Um, Although these things look locally the same, you know, right here, there's this degree four vertex where these things meet and that's right here. And if you go all the way around, you could say that's the same as moving here. And then you see another degree four vertex. So this infinite branching tree locally looks the same as the figure eight, but their spectra are actually different because the um, configuration, which is really, unif which is just the uniform superposition on the figure eight is not normalized on the tree. It's just the superposition of all overall vertices, which is not normalized because it's an infinite tree. Um, so you can take that and you can take that inability to estimate the energy and bootstrap it into an inability to um, uh, solve the problem of um, what the adiabatic algorithm does. You can construct a setting where there's some graph like this figure eight graph and you have an additional site and you can, um, so you have this figure eight graph and you have an additional site over here and you can tunnel from the additional site to the figure eight and you start with the energy on the additional site low you turn on the tunneling to the figure eight, you raise the energy of the additional site up, and then you turn off the tunneling to the figure eight. And you can make it so that um, if you correctly can compute the energy of the figure eight graph at the end, you'll wind up on the figure eight. But if you misestimate it, you stay on the single site and you can make then um, uh, 
pathing to go Monte Carlo wind up sampling the wrong ground states because it, it can't correct the measure. Sorry, can, can hey, I- Was there a question? Can you, yeah, can I interrupt? Yes, please. Uh, so if, so this shows that quantum Monte Carlo cannot sample um, this partition function, but can adiabatic quantum computing uh, explore all this? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, so the point is that this is, a uh, you can, um, make a, uh, you know, this is exact path where it's, it's just a very simple thing. It's a figure eight, which you might discretize into a bunch of little sites if you want to make it, you know, really a discrete problem. And um, then it's a, it's a Hamiltonian with no sign problem because it's just hopping between those sites. And uh, you just, you know, can, you can explicitly work out a path where you start raising the energy on the, you turn on a little bit of tunneling between the two, you raise the energy here, you turn off the tunneling and you explicitly compute the spectra and you see, oh yeah, there's always a gap that's not too small. And yet path integral Monte Carlo is completely off. And there's not even an end parameter here because it's just a, you know, we'll need an end when we need to be more complicated algorithms. But, uh, right, okay. but yeah, yeah, path integral, it's so, so these, these, these trajectories are present in, are known about by adiabatic, um, but not- Wonderful. By, uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, you can also ask about diffusion Monte Carlo. I mentioned diffusion Monte Carlo was another algorithm and there's a result of Jared et al. Um, yeah, Jordan Lackey, um, that uh, you can, on how to beat that. And I, I mentioned that it's a method with these walkers that move and they're sampled with the probability proportional to the um, uh, weight, to the ground state wave function itself, not to its square. And you have a birth and death of the walkers. So the idea to beat that is imagine a case where the L1 norm of the ground state, so just like the sum over x psi of x is concentrated on certain sites, but the sum over x psi of x squared, the L2 norm is concentrated on other sites. So you can actually think about things that are tree-like and um, you can imagine a very large, but finite tree, a finite tree now with putting a different energy on the root, put that root energy slightly negative compared to the leaves. And you can make it then by tuning the energies appropriately so that the norm squared of the wave function is heavily concentrated at the root, but the norm of the wave function is heavily concentrated at the leaves because you know the, you have many leaves, but the amplitude is smaller on them. So squaring it makes it really, really small. So you can make the one case so that the diffusion Monte Carlo is completely sampling configurations out on the leaves, but the true thing is happening at the root, but it can never get to the root unless it has exponentially many walkers. So you can beat diffusion Monte Carlo in that way also. Um, so the goal here and the, the, the result, um, uh, um, is to, to try to beat all algorithms, not just um, uh, the, the diffusion Monte Carlo and uh, path integral Monte Carlo to the separation for all algorithms. So what we might try to do is to combine these things, to imagine combining topological obstructions with a difference in um, L2 and L1 norms. And this is a figure from the uh, Gillian and Vazirani paper. Um, and uh, what they do is they have a, a graph um, where there's a certain vertex, which is the start. And there's this, this simpler than the construction in my paper, um, but the decoration is, is the same thing. I'm gonna talk about with this decoration. There's a, a start and an end. And there's a complicated thing with a lot of loops where you need to correctly sample the loops to get from one to the other. Um, but the key idea uh, that makes it hard is that, uh, is that there's these, um, so, so you, you wanna make it so that whether you can navigate from the entrance of this graph to the exit of this graph. It's a graph where you have, where it's a question of being able to correctly navigate within a certain graph. But the way that you make it hard to navigate for a classical algorithm is you go attach these trees. And what a decoration tree is, is it's a lot like that tree I was mentioning for the um, uh, beating the uh, uh, diffusion Monte Carlo, this decoration tree. Um, it's just it's just literally a tree. It, we've only shown here um, just one level of the tree, but you'd make it a few levels and this is a parameter to adjust. You'd make it a few levels of the tree. And um, in the framework of diffusion Monte Carlo, a lot of the norm will get concentrated there. But in general, um, what you do is you tune the parameters on the tree so that they have essentially negligible effect on what happens in the graph in the quantum setting. The, uh, um, Hamiltonian restricted to the tree will be chosen so that it has a, uh, an energy that's much higher than that on the graph. And not because there's diagonal elements on the tree, but just because it's a finite tree and ends somewhere. All the, every single edge on this graph has the same matrix element and all the vertices, except for this entrance and exit have no diagonal element. Um, so this, these, 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 uh, these trees will have a higher energy simply because they end somewhere. 
they're, they're finite trees. And this is a important property of um, dealing with things on a tree. You know, if you have a line, as a line gets long, the energy starts, a finite line, as an engine, finite line gets long, the energy starts to be the same as if you had a ring. But if you have a tree, a finite tree still has a difference in energy from to compared to something that connects back on itself. And that difference persists no matter how big the tree is. So you put these, this tree out here um, on it. And what will tend to happen is that um, uh, um, a, part, a, 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 a walker can be walking along the graph and then might take a step on the tree. And then it has no way of distinguishing the tree from the rest of the graph. And this is the important part of the Oracle setting. In the Oracle setting, all you learn is when you query a graph, what are the neighbors? So all it learns here is, oh, this is a vertex with a lot of neighbors, but this one is also a vertex without a lot of neighbors. So it has no way of knowing that it's stepping off the graph where it's supposed to be. And it'll follow the tree until eventually it hits a leaf and go, oh, I wasn't supposed to be there. This was one of those trees that, you know, we're, tell we're giving the algorithm the maximum amount of knowledge. You know, we're getting, I, I could tell you what the construction in the paper is and you still couldn't beat it. So you know that, the, that these trees have been, been added. Um, these trees have been added um, and it'll eventually hit the leaf of the tree and go, oh, I wasn't supposed to all that and jump back, but just wasted time on the tree. Based on the deep the tree is, it's wasted time. Um, so the main part has a lot of loops, and you you decorate by attaching these trees, and that makes it hard to find the loops. Um, then the key thing is that you attach trees onto the trees. So here I switch colors. So you might have a blue tree. So you have your main graph, and you have this blue tree, and the particle starts following the blue tree. But on top of the blue tree, you have the orange trees. So if you just got to stay on the blue tree and you go back to the start, you in reality might not know exactly where to go back to. But you go back to the start and then go again and back back on another blue tree and waste time on the other blue tree. But actually what's going to happen is you're not going to just follow the blue tree. You're going to go along the blue tree and then you're going to waste time on this little orange tree. And then you're going to, oh, that was a waste. Jump back here. Try maybe this time. Time there are travel um, so that it uh, um, uh, necessarily the algorithm wastes a lot of time and uh, these n to the n versus um, in later construction exponential of um, uh, a sublinear power of n differences depend upon like how exactly you attach the trees. There's a limit to how many trees you can attach before it actually starts to have an effect on the ground state, how many trees you can attach before you start having too many um, states to represent with a, the, the length of the bit strings you allow and so on. So, but um, by correctly attaching the right number, you can get these, these large separations and show that every classical algorithm must waste a lot of time exploring these states where the quantum one does not waste any of this time. So um, an outlook. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that are left open. One, one question is, um, you know, initially all we knew up until uh, about a year ago was that um, we didn't really know anything. We knew that, that, that the, you could beat um, path integral Monte Carlo, but we didn't know that there might be algorithms that would take still some clever algorithm that would take polynomial time. Then finally it got to N to the log N, which is just barely super polynomial. Then it got to um, x of uh, n to the, I guess, I think one fifth, um, which is the latest one. But it's, it's, you know, you might still wonder, can it be proven that the time really needs to be exponential in n? That's um, a question. Can you show that there's really, it must take a lot of time? Or conversely, um, is there a classical algorithm that provably never takes fully exponential of n time, but takes exponential of some sublinear power always? So, uh, you know, when you look at these oracle separations that First interesting thing is to show that something is super polynomial. Then, okay, this not even quasi polynomial, but then you can wonder, can we get it all the way to exponential? Um, so that's uh, kind of an interesting theory question. Conversely, are there any useful classical algorithms that could uh, that could do something something there? Um, another question is, can we get a useful quantum algorithm out of this? So this is a really a purely contrived example. You know, it was made up to fool an oracle. Um, this decoration was made, sorry, was made up to fool an algorithm. The decoration by the Oracle was made up exactly to be confusing for classical algorithms. Um, and um, maybe, you know, most of the classical algorithms will do well in practice. This idea of using path integral Monte Carlo and slowly changing the Hamiltonian works pretty well in practice for 
many Hamiltonians. Um, and uh, it can be beaten even more simply than this, but uh, it works well in practice. So this is still a very contrived example, but we might wonder, are there any useful class quantum algorithms that can come out of this? So I wanna recall, um, sure, I'm sure uh, almost everyone's heard of Shor's algorithm, the uh, algorithm for factoring on a quantum computer. Um, but there's also an algorithm, Simon's algorithm. Um, and Simon's algorithm is an Oracle problem. So Shor's algorithm is an algorithm to factor numbers in polynomial time. Um, you can factor them classically in less than exponential time, but it still takes this kind of exponential of a power time to factor a number. Um, there's no proof that there's no cl polynomial classical algorithm. Essentially, the reason we believe there's no polynomial classical factoring algorithm is just that people have tried very hard and no one's come up with one. Um, but Simon's algorithm is an algorithm for doing a problem very similar to factoring, but it's with respect to an oracle. And there, there is a provable separation, a provable exponential separation between them. And you could regard Shor's algorithm as saying, we're going to take Simon's algorithm. And there's a particular choice of oracle that is an oracle relevant for this factoring problem. Um, and uh, so, so you start with an oracle separation and then you get a, um, and this isn't, I don't, well, I don't know the history exactly of how it happened, but one way to think about it is to say you have an oracle separation and then you instantiate the oracle in a particular way and that gives you a, um, uh, a useful quantum algorithm. So we could have wondered if something similar can happen here. We have an oracle separation between um, what this adiabatic quantum computing with no sign problem can do and it acts on some interesting ways that uh, are unrelated to other sort of, you know, algorithms in quantum computing. You know, you, you, you just because, uh, Hamiltonian, if you do adiabatic computing with a sign problem, you can do all of BQP and then you can do the same oracle separation like Simon's algorithm to show that with respect to an oracle, that is harder than um, uh, uh, um, what you can do classically. But here was sort of a different kind of oracle separation. So it might inspire a different kind of quantum algorithm. So we might wonder whether some new quantum algorithm could come out based on, I don't know, these finding paths in there, finding states with large L1 versus our L2 norm, finding closed loops and something. I've tried, I haven't had any success, but there may be something there. And we can wonder whether any of the ideas could be useful in numerical condensed matter practice um, or numerical energy uh, uh, physics practice. That is uh, when you have actually, you know, if, if, if someone could come up with a, a faster classical algorithm that could then provably work in less than exponential time against these oracles, whether that could help in equilibrating settings. You know, there are cases where, um, topological obstructions really appear for uh, um, simulating condensed matter systems. So if you have a superfluid on a ring and you want to know the superfluid stiffness, um, what you want to know is actually literally the winding number of the particles in imaginary time. Um, but since we know what that is, we can add in the moves. You can add in the needed quantum, the needed moves to equilibrate different topological sectors. Uh, but you know, maybe there are some other cases where it's not as easy and some, some of this may or may not have Help, I don't know. Um, so let me stop here and take any questions. Thanks. Okay. So now, um, anybody can ask a question. Either they can just unmute. Yeah. Uh, may I ask a question? So, yeah. Uh, so so my question is about uh, related to the last uh, article. So, do you expect there will be an local Hamiltonian that actually have this type of obstructions? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So first of all, you know, like there is no chance that we're gonna come up with a local Hamiltonian where we can prove a separation because explicitly now you're dealing with a problem that's not an Oracle problem. You know, if it's a problem where you say, oh, it's a Hamiltonian that acts on two or three spins and it's written this way, then you're not gonna prove a separation. Um, you could fully, even if that Hamiltonian comes from Oracle, you could fully query, learn the polynomial many queries. So you're really asking, can I P from B, B, B? But you're thinking, um, could we make up a local Hamiltonian problem where similar kinds of effects occur, where there are um, interesting topological obstructions or where there are L2 versus L1 obstructions? And uh, yes, you could, you, could, you could definitely make up such things. I'm not sure how more or less contrived they are. Um, and because they are local things, there'll be some other algorithm that could that could solve them. But you could make up things where you could make up local Hamiltonians that defeat fusion Monte Carlo and defeat path integral Monte Carlo, given as those, those given as algorithms. Um, but uh, so you can have these kinds of effects occur in there, but you won't be able to prove a separation. 
Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, another question is actually about variation on the color. So what, what actually I'm doing. So yeah, uh, I I ask some this type of question to other people who are working on yeah this arithmetic on the computation, and they actually said that the ranges of variation on the color is much different and and it is much less understood theoretically. So yeah, can he also make some type of uh, problem that variation on the color doesn't work? Uh, so when you say variation on Monte Carlo, you mean um, this algorithm where you have a variational wave function and then you sample yes. different configurations of the wave yes. function. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I would suspect that the, the cases where you have, that there certainly are cases where you have trouble equilibrating. Um, and I, but I would suspect that those are more related to non-topological problems, but more related to problems in like finding ground state of a spin glass that you could encode some, that there would be, you know, there are variational states where um, uh, it's hard to find the configurations that maximize the variational state. You know, I can just make up one, which is to say, oh, well, here's my variational state. Uh, we variational state is um, uh, e to the beta, uh, J I J Z I C J based on you know the the spin so it's literally the um, the amplitudes are are literally like the, the the probabilities the bolts are taken from a Boltzmann distribution of some spin glass so there's but of course you're free not to consider such wave functions so you're free yeah, to consider yeah, sure. other. yeah. so um, no it's a good question then I I don't know I, I I think it's an interesting question I think it's a very interesting question but I don't know um, yeah whether there are some cases where there's sort of sort of more subtle quantum effects where wave functions that you'd naturally consider would get stuck or not. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Don't have anything. Yeah, thank you very that. much. I have a question about a statement uh, about uh, when you introduce non-stochastic Hamiltonians that you have this intuition that uh, they won't help you, right? But there are counter examples. Uh, it's a paper by Nishimori where they show that in a mean field model, having a non-stochastic um, uh, Hamiltonian helps solving the ground state. So can you comment on what's the intuition behind not believing that uh, yeah. non-stochastic Hamiltonians mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. help? Yeah, and just to uh, clarify for those in the audience, stochastic is another term for no sign problem. So it depends which community you grew up in, I guess. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, there are, sure, you can come up with examples where different things happen. But essentially, the reason that, um, the, the reason we strongly believe that um, for these unstructured Hamiltonians that you're going to get a uh, super exponentially small gap is that you can kind of see, it's exactly what um, Al Truller and company said, um, is that uh, you're going to have cases where um, there's some configuration that's maybe the true ground state of your spin glass. And then there's some other configuration, which is very far away. And this is almost exactly the property that makes a spin glass hard to solve, that, that the configurations which are close in energy may have nothing to do with the configuration which minimizes the energy. So there might be a configuration which involves flipping a significant fraction of the spins, like half the spins, or even just like a 10th of the spins, a large fraction of spins, which is close in energy, which is a tiny bit up, order one up, a little bit in energy up. And you can then also have it, and this will typically happen, um, that for some of those configurations, there will be opportunity for some of the other configurations to gain more energy with respect to um, uh, local spin flips. Um, and so that they, you know, if you, if you think about how does the energy of a given configuration vary as you turn on a transverse field, well, the, the spin configuration, the ground state is say all the spins polarized in a certain way and in the Z basis. So when you turn on a transverse field, the energy just doesn't change to linear order in the field, but it changes to second order. And so to second order in the field, you know, the energy goes like down in some way. Um, but then you, it's easy to come up with a case. And this typically happens just by chance a lot where a slightly higher energy state comes down a little bit, so it's high energy, but it comes down a little bit faster and the energy becomes smaller at some small value of the field. Um, and so now, you know, at a certain value of the field, you're over here, and then you have to get to some incredibly different state at a slightly different value of the field. And you're asking the thing to quantum tunnel over a very large uh, trajectory. Now, I, I can't see any positive reason to think it would be able to do that tunneling. You know, instead of, it's, it, I think the onus should be on showing why one thinks it could be able to do this tunneling between incredibly disparate states at a very small value of the field. I mean, I mean the calculations, you know, the straightforward calculations give a super exponentially small gap because you have a very small field and a large difference in states. But the intuition then further why adding a sign problem is essentially adding a sign problem makes it less coherent. It makes it more 
localized, more many body localized. So I think it would have a harder time than getting from one configuration to another um, when you turn it on. Um, I don't know if there's any, you know, more detailed results to that effect, but that's just my intuition that you're interfering between different trajectories in a destructive way. So you're making it less likely that you can get a constructive interference to get you somewhere else where you want to go. I see. So it's about this science introducing negative um, interference yeah, I think, versus... I think, I think, yeah, I mean, and even if, and if that's the heuristic argument, but even if not, I would sort of think, well, I, I but I would like to know what the reason for thinking it would, you know, what, you know, what's, what's the reason we would think it help in general? I, I think this, this sort of problem that you're asking to tunnel between very far away states in a very small field is just kind of generally present. So that has to be somehow evaded. Okay. I mean, you might Thanks. say also, you're happy to get a state of fairly low energy. In some cases you might say that, well, I didn't find the ground state, the relatively low energy state. So that might be good enough. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, so maybe let's thank Professor Hastings one more time. Thank you. <laughs>